Hey everyone and welcome to the Conscious Eating Evolution Series. I'm Karina, a Conscious Eating Catalyst and Soul Relationship Guide and have created this series to give you a more holistic overview around the power of food so you are more enabled to make healthier and more mindful choices for yourself and this planet. And today we are going to talk about mindfulness and emotional eating with Sarah Thacker. And Sarah is a licensed therapist, certified EMDR practitioner, board certified art therapist, holistic health coach, yoga instructor and therapist. And she's also the author of the book, Holistic Food Therapy, a mindful approach to making peace with food and offers an integrative approach to mental and overall wellness in her practices, addressing mind, body and spirit. A warm welcome, Sarah, from my side. I'm so happy and thankful that you join us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this summit and all of the wonderful offerings that it will have. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So let's dive right in and um, find out a little bit more about you, because I think like as we're talking a lot about food in the summit, we all have a relationship or had a different relationship maybe at some point with food. And what brought you into um, the place or the practice that you do today um, yeah, in regards to what you do? Yeah. So food is complicated. <laughs> and many people do have a very challenging relationship with food. Everybody has a food story or messages that we've received about food, what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. It's constantly in the media. It's, you know, body weight and size and, you know, all of the, uh, there's just so much around dieting and the dieting industry. And so I'm a therapist by training and then also a health coach. And so many people were coming to me saying, I know what to eat. It's not the problem. It's more about, I don't know how to stop eating these other foods, or I don't know how to manage what is going on internally. And so they really wanted that integrated approach. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't until I had some gut distress issues and had to have that healed that I recognized my own <laughs> emotional eating. And what often happens with so many people is that we go to food for it before we even recognize that's what we're doing. So it's an unconscious desire to have those feelings not be um, experienced. And mm -hmm. so for me, it was anxiety, it was a big, I would just not want to feel anxious and so I would just be eating mindlessly and going to things like bread and cheese and <laughs> not the most healthy foods all the time and just feeling then satiated temporarily but then that of course never goes away and so it was sort of this coming together where I had these people in my practice looking for that type of as I was also going through my own <laughs> gut healing process and then healing my own relationship with food and it was really a very powerful coming together in that way of how the work came to be that and how it started to integrate the mindfulness piece especially with the therapy and then bringing in conscious awareness of food mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah it's like often like a powerful personal story that brings a lot of people into like the place where that then can really help others because they understand what really goes on on like on the other end and not only yes. from a conceptual intellectual level which is really cool and awesome so i really would love to like create a like a common ground so people really know what mindfulness is and yes. what emotional eating really is i would really love you to you know talk a little bit about that absolutely so mm -hmm. mindfulness is paying attention from moment to moment with a non-judgmental awareness and that is just the foundation of being present, of being engaged deeply in the present moment. And mindful eating is bringing those same principles to the process of eating. Emotional eating is turning to food to either suppress or numb emotions. And so that could be any emotion. And it could even be something that we might perceive as a positive emotion or a negative emotion. But from the mindfulness perspective, Emotions are all just emotions. There's not good ones, there's not bad ones. They're all just information about how we are experiencing our life. And so if an emotion, something like anger or jealousy comes up, that's not a bad thing. It's how do we recognize why did that emotion show up in the first place? And so mindfulness allows us to get in there and understand that, which is why the mindfulness perspective is so valuable in helping to heal relationship with food. And so that's the, those kind of two <laughs> bases of what mindfulness is. And the non-judgment piece is one of the most key components so that we're not judging the experience, not judging the food that we're eating. We're not judging our emotions. 
and being able to look at those from those two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And how do eating disorders relate to that, like to emotional eating? So emotional eating often goes undetected when it's just something that is, you know, it might be that we go, you know, like soothing emotional emotions with food and then an eating disorder is where it becomes something that's no longer manageable and, and it becomes very wrapped up into body image. Food essentially just becomes a metaphor for how we're handling life in general. And so the, the food becomes not really the actual problem. It's more of these other emotions that are not being managed or dealt with effectively. And then that can turn into more of a disorder. Disordered eating and into eating full-blown eating disorders are far more complicated. Emotional eating is still very complicated, but it goes into where it can be um, de more deeply rooted into the emotional system and make much more challenging to, to be able to come out of. Mindfulness is still a very effective treatment for those full blown eating disorders as well, but that's emotional eating tends to be on the spectrum. And if it goes undetected for a long time, it can easily transition into a full blown eating disorder. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is like emotional eating, is it really a common thing like among society that we are just not aware of? I think so. I think the whole, and there's two components to it as well, because having a craving is something like, oh, you know, I'm kind of craving something sweet or something salty. That could be an emotional craving and it could just be a general craving. And so it's really being able to, to kind of tease out the two. But very often the foods that are go-to during cravings or during times of wanting to numb, they're not necessarily the healthiest choices. And so then they become foods that also have this addictive component. And so there's mm -hmm. this other layer to manage as well. Now, if we eat sugar, probably sugar is going to continue to ask for more sugar. Mm -hmm. And just like if we're suppressing an emotion, that emotion doesn't just go away just because we've eaten, it's temporarily numbed, but it will rise back to the surface at some point. And then there's going to need to be more and more and more of the food to continue to suppress the emotion. And so there's that, that kind of standard that we set that it's an acceptable way of managing emotion mm -hmm. and kind of sugar and and kind of foods that are not necessarily the most tend to be so easily available to you so it comes from both directions mm -hmm. so it's often as well like emotional eating a form of escapism from whatever you are really experiencing yeah. in the moment mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. and eating is something we have to do and so if it's mm -hmm. if someone with something that's more overt like alcohol or something then it's that can be ended right you can make a choice not to drink alcohol we don't need it for our survival but we do have to eat and so that creates a lot more complication in healing emotional eating because there is the requirement to be alive to eat mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely so um and what is like the the role of mindfulness really in uh, relation to dealing with food cravings and then with emotional eating or conscious eating? Yes. So emotional eating is because often the emotion arises, just like when I would experience a lot of anxiety and I didn't want to feel better. I had like a, a really stressful day, then I would just want, you know, like a big calzone or something and just to kind of numb out. And I didn't even have that awareness. And so the first step is mindfulness requires that we're paying attention in the moment. And so if you're mindfully aware, then you're going to notice body sensations. You're going to notice the, the symptoms, so to speak, of anxiety or another emotion. If uh, when we're paying attention for in the moment and not judging that as a good or bad experience, then there's a much healthier way we can adapt to create a new way to manage it so that we're not going to food. And so it allows both the ability to make a choice because if we're just reacting out of internal mechanisms of like cravings or whatever, then you're not really offering ourselves a real choice. But if you're taking a moment to take a step back and notice how you're feeling, notice the sensations in your body, tuning into what that emotion really is and what it's there to show you, then you're able to make a choice. And that's very empowering. So it allows this opening into a space where you get to figure what does what is gonna be right for me in this moment. And when we're bringing that same concept into mindful eating, so it's being able to taste, being able to appreciate the aromas, the flavors, so that food can truly be a pleasurable experience. We just don't want it to be the only form of pleasure that we're getting in life. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, and what kind of, uh, what would be a way of practicing more mindfulness uh, or bring it more, even though if people are not necessarily like emotional eaters, um, I think it's as well for those a really interesting concept to bring in uh, into the practice. Absolutely. Yeah, mindfulness is, I like to think of it like putting a little soft white light bulb on everything and just observing. And so when you're practicing mindfulness, it's allowing yourself to notice everything, but you're not attending to anything. So you notice that there might be thoughts running through your mind, but you're not trying to attach to those thoughts or get stuck into a story about the thought. When you're practicing mindfulness, you might notice their sounds in the environment. And instead of being irritated by that or frustrated that there's this noise happening, it's just noticing it's just a sound and it uh, detaches this emotion from an experience. And it allows you just to be present with what is really true, which is the main value of, of mindfulness is being able to connect with what is true right now. And is there some emotion that's getting in the way of recognizing that? And then as you practice it, it's, it's helpful. So when you think about meditation, it's a little different. So meditation is more of like a laser beam focus. So you're bringing your attention to one thing, like a mantra or your breath or a an image or um, you know, any, anything that's just one thing to focus on. And when you're focusing just in that one way, that's that you're still kind of mindful because all those distractions are going to be present. But being mindful is something we can bring into every single moment. Mm -hmm. And it's the ability to, particularly as it relates to food, whether you're an emotional eater or not, being able to mindfully eat. Because everyone has the experience of mindless eating. Everybody gets like eating a bag of chips and wondering like, what happened? How did I get to the bottom? Or mm -hmm. overeating and feeling a little overly full. And that's a, a symptom of mindless eating because it's not really paying attention to hunger and full cues. Because mm -hmm. our bodies are gonna tell us when to stop. And mindless eating, also eating like a whole meal that might've been a really nicely prepared, delicious, healthy meal and not tasting it because you're distracted doing something else mm -hmm. or thinking about what else you have to do after the meal is over rather than just being present with what is happening right now. And that is where mindfulness comes in as a way of being that is extremely valuable. As it relates to the emotional world, it's the same exact concept. So that you're allowing, and particularly if people have been kind of emotionally removed or suppressed for a long time, it can feel a little awkward, but it's just like slowly getting into it where you start with just having a minute to just be present. So you're just noticing and trying to label experience. So labeling thoughts just as a thought rather than thinking about the story of the thought or getting lost into that. And being able to label any distractions like a body sensation, a sound or an emotion just for what it is rather than naming it or connecting to it. And then once you feel more comfortable just being present, then be, being able to check in with the emotional world a bit and to notice what is that, what emotion am I experiencing? Or was there an emotion I suppressed today, or, you know, am I feeling a little edgy or, you know, whatever of that might be coming up at the end of the day or lonely or bored or anything. And then being able to understand what is that emotion there to show me? Why am I feeling this feeling? Because it's there for a reason. And when we suppress it, we don't get that valuable information. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love it so much because like food is something that um, is like, we need to do it every day. Yeah. And it's such a great availability of practice yeah. that you can do rather than, okay, I need to do my meditation. I need to sit down and, you know, but you can ex actually implement it like in a daily routine Absolutely. and then from then expand it into other areas as well in your life, whenever you are, you know, acting out of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes it, I think when applied to life in general, it just mm -hmm. allows your experience of life to be far, far more enriched and mm -hmm. valuable feel more connected to mm -hmm. instead of living in your head or in fear and you know emotion that a lot of times emotions that come up we notice them it's some of that anxiety was self-created <laughs> some of that was you know worrying about a worst case scenario that may or may not even happen and yet it's still triggering those same desires to eat or to numb or to come away from that but then if you can recognize through mindfulness and awareness that some of this is self-created in terms of my, these are just negative thought loops that end up occurring in my mind. 
then I'm able to make a shift and a, and a change with how I'm reacting to those or being able to identify if the thought is useful or not useful, or is it true or not true? And when you can do that, it allows you again to connect with what is true right now. And if that thought is not what's true, it's a fear-based thought that may or may not happen in the future, then it's not serving any purpose right now. It's only creating a layer of stress that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And so are there like common emotions that arise, especially in regards uh, like that are, that you know from your practice that are like really common within people that arise? Absolutely. To that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think loneliness is often a, a number one go to just feeling like food will be my friend. And when I'm eating, it offers this temporary pleasure and comfort. And so it creates an opportunity to not feel the disconnection that someone may be experiencing out of loneliness. Boredom is another big one, not knowing what to do with time and that it feels like I'm not really sure what to do. So I guess I'll eat something. Mm -hmm. procrastination is a huge one so it's like mm -hmm. oh, I don't really want to get to that or it's gonna be stressful or overwhelming to you know <clears throat> do this task or write this thing and so I'll just eat first <laughs> and so it becomes something that is it's just used in these other ways but to fill that um, that time mm -hmm. and anger and you know any emotion can be soothed with food but the loneliness boredom procrastination, then anxiety often tends to be one where it's just kind of that catch-all word, anxiety for, for all the stress in life that becomes overwhelming, that is really more about fear or, or um, you know, projecting fear thoughts into the future, that that food brings you back to just like, well, oh, kind of feeling numb for a moment mm -hmm. and not, and, and the process of eating allows you to not have to think for that little bit of time. And so that often is another big one, the fear and the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. And so why is the concept of non-judgment and mindfulness and relating to emotional and like healing emotional and stressful eating so important? The concept of non-judgment is just that, not judging what your experience is. And so if you're judging an emotion, if I'm feeling angry and I'm judging that as a bad emotion, then I'm going to feel like I'm a bad person for feeling that feeling. When really anger shows up to show us, I'm not okay with something right now. I'm not okay with how I'm being treated. I'm not okay with what's occurring right now. And that's a really valuable thing to know because then you can make an empowered decision around, if I'm not okay with how I'm being treated, how am I going to either ask to be treated differently? Am I going to create a boundary so I'm not subjected to that? treatment or in some way be able to stand up for myself rather you know I think we're taught often just like oh you know like just oh, that's just how people are whatever and so we don't stand up for ourselves and that gets suppressed suppressed and then it builds um non so when I feel like okay that's a bad emotion and judging it then that creates this feeling I'm a bad person the same with food and so if I feel like I'm eating this you know, particular food, a cookie or something else that is a bad food, if I'm on this very restrictive diet, then I feel like I'm a bad person now because I've eaten it or I've been bad. You know, I hear that all the time. Like, oh, I was, I was bad today because I ate this or that food that's like off limits. And so that inevitably there's going to be the craving for something if we're viewing it as off limits, if it's just, we're not allowed to have it. So non-judgment says food is just food. There are healthy choices we can make. And Ideally, we want to nourish our body. Ideally, we want to feed it what's going to give it energy and healing and health that we need. And that, but if we look at all of anything that doesn't provide that is bad, then it creates that function of now I'm a bad person if I eat that. It's not a bad thing to occasionally eat a cookie. It's not the end of the world, right? And so if you feel like if we're eating foods that are not necessarily the most nourishing, and yet it's coming from a space of, you know, you're celebrating or you're at a, an event or someone has made your cookies. And then so it, it, it just gets very tied into all of this fear and confusion. And that can be unhealthy on that other end as well. If you choose not to eat something because it doesn't make you feel good, that's a very empowered decision. So to say, like, oh, thank you so much for making these cookies. Unfortunately, you know, digestively, I just can't handle that or I'm, you know, I, that is, is an empowered way to manage it. So it's not viewing it as a bad food. It's just not a good, great food for my body. And that same concept, I think, with the conscious, kind of the whole concept of the summit about this conscious eating is 
as we become more conscious and as I work with, um, you know, for myself and my own history with food, but also with many people I work with as they start to feel really good, like bringing in food that feels nourishing and healing and allows your body to function really well, like healthy digestion, healthy skin, all of these things that start to show, then it's like, well, I don't really want to go back to some of those foods because they're not good for me. And so then it's not this restrictive, I'm not allowed to eat that. It just becomes an intuitive way to be because that's what feels right for your body. And that is, I think, the huge difference between the concept of mindful eating, intuitive eating, and the kind of the whole dieting concept of mm. nothing is off limits. But also at some point, most people find, well, there are some foods that just make me not feel so great. So I'm going to choose mm. not to eat those. And that's again, such a much more. And that ju removes the judgment from it. It's not bad. It's just not for me. Not for me. Yeah. And I love that because it's so like, because then they have like paid the attention to what they actually were eating and then checked back in with their body. Absolutely. It's the practice then of mindfulness as well to know if it was really like sitting right or not. <laughs> right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. It's really cool. And um, um, how can you like, like the cravings, especially, how can you differentiate between what is actually a craving that you're just, you know, wanting some sugar or whatever, or really having hunger, like really being hungry? I think a lot of people are confused between those two sometimes as well. Like what yeah. does my body really need and what not? So cravings are, you know, many people have cravings every day for certain foods or for different things. And I like to think of cravings as more of a message that your body is sending you, just like an emotion. So a craving is something that will arise for a particular reason. Something is most likely out of balance and particularly from the general craving standpoint. So if you checked in with emotions and you're like, okay, am I, is there something I haven't dealt with or am I anxious? Am I, you know, frustrated? Is there something going on? Am I lonely? Am I bored? If you're really feeling like, no, it's just, I really want this particular food for some reason, then that's where you can check in and like, am I well hydrated? Because being dehydrated, not getting enough water can be a craving, certainly for other food, just because it's wanting, the body is wanting to feel more balanced. If you are deficient in a particular nutrient, then absolutely the body will crave foods, potentially even the last time they got that nutrient. So it might be some odd food that you're craving and that could be mm -hmm. and it's like wanting that nutrient. And when things are really out of balance, so if you are eating more sugar, absolutely there's going to be the craving for sugar. And because that's an imbalance, you don't need to have excessive amounts of sugar running through our system all the time. And so when there is, then it tends to crave more sugar. And so that tends to be something that can just be an awareness rather than, am I craving the sugar for an emotional reason right now? Mm -hmm. And then knowing the difference, once you've separated it out, you can usually try a couple of things. And one thing that I recommend is a, just a three-step protocol where it's First, pausing, giving yourself some time. And you can literally set a timer in that time or just give yourself time. So I've had the craving, and so now I'm going to give myself five minutes to drink some water, um, check in, see what's going on. Is, there, is this an emotional craving or is this a general craving? And if so, why might it be here? So that you're really giving yourself time just to pause. And then you move into the reflection phase. So if it is an emotional craving, and you want to reflect on why it's there. And that could be a great time to do some journaling, to do some um, you know, art making or something else that's going to create an outlet for the emotion that you might be experiencing or call and get support from somebody. But in some way, being able to just reflect on what is this emotion about and how else can I serve myself to manage it? And then releasing it. So if it's an emotion that... Um, I, I'm anxious and I'm feeling this way because of self-created fear that is not useful, then I want to release it. I want to let it go. If I have recognized, well, I'm anxious because I have this thing coming up and I, you know, thought up and can I do something then to use that anxiety for something productive? So if I'm anxious about, you know, something that's coming up in the future, can I either do some work towards it? Can I talk about it? You know, what do I need to do to release this anxiety? So sometimes it's a choice, like I just need to let it go. And sometimes it's a choice I can do something about it. And that's, you know, like within the world of therapy, that's called a coping skill. So it's something that helps to manage the emotion more effectively in that moment. 
That's awesome. I think that's very helpful for a lot of people. And I like uh, that you pointed out that sometimes you have a craving and you're craving a certain food, but you don't necessarily need that food with certain minerals or whatever and uh, or deficiencies that you might have. So you need to get actually like maybe a different fruit that is available in that. Um, do you have anything on that more deeply to say how people can differentiate or is it? It's really in that pause. So if, if you are feeling, and also, you know, cravings can come from having kind of a boring or repetitive um, kind of menu that you have for yourself. And so most likely that that's going to breed some nutrition deficiencies, right? There's, if you're only eating one particular thing or only eating a lot of pasta or something all the time, then most likely your body's going to need things. So I always just say, like, it can't hurt to do some veggies. <laughs> and that will be um, just getting in, you know, food that comes up from the ground is most likely there is some sort of nutritional deficiency that your body is craving, maybe some, you know, like vitamin, you know, E or something or, or um, magnesium, then just having a really robust, colorful salad is going to help mm -hmm. rebalance. And so I always recommend if, if there's a healthy version of what you can have first and have that, and if it, if that helps, then you feel more balanced nutritionally and, and your body feels healthier, then most likely those cravings will subside, which again, mm -hmm. is good feedback internally in that mindful-based way of recognizing, now that I've eaten that and I feel better and I'm not having the same level of cravings, mm -hmm. then it becomes a more sustainable way of eating. And so that in itself is really valuable. Water and veggies are always the uh, <laughs> first go to. <laughs> <laughs> and you know or nuts and seeds and things that are going to be nourishing and then finding then if you're still craving something else now in the instance of craving something like it's really not an imbalance and I really do just kind of want this particular food like chocolate or something else then allowing yourself to have it again from that restricting restrictive standpoint is not useful and so if you allow yourself to have it and you eat it mindfully you're much less likely to overindulge, so you're much less likely to, to binge or to overeat on it. And you also will notice, well, if I do either binge or overeat on it, or if it makes my stomach upset or whatever, if you're being mindful, then you're gonna notice all of those pieces. If you eat just one really delicious square of chocolate and you're fine after that and you feel good, and you've eaten it mindfully, it doesn't produce cravings, then it's a, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's, it's a practice and mindfulness of being mm -hmm. present with what you're doing rather than judging, rather than, um, you know, only giving into cravings rather than really evaluating why it's there. Mm -hmm. And I like that you pointed out it's a practice because I yeah. think like it's nothing that has, gets us there right away. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, really think to implement. And yeah, um, like how, like if people are inspired, how would they be able to connect more deeply with you? Um, how do they find you? Yeah, so my website is holisticfoodtherapy.com, which is the same name as my book. And that's, a, that's holistic with a WH, at the W is at the beginning of the word holistic for whole foods and whole person, because that's what we really work to address. Um, and I, so that's the best place to find me. I'm also, on Facebook and Instagram and stuff with the same, the holistic food therapy. So that's mm -hmm. where people can find me. <laughs> okay, awesome. And you have a free gift as well to share. Yes. So I have, um, it's a seven day kick your cravings to the curb challenge. And so for seven days, you receive an email from me and it has a video of me talking about what you're going to focus on for that day. And then some action steps to take to begin to explore the nature of cravings. So it goes through in depth the the whole um, general versus an emotional craving and how to tell the difference. And then if it is a general craving, what you might do to manage that. And then it goes into emotional for the main part of the, the five days, the last five days anyway, are all about the emotional cravings. And there's supportive um, articles in there, but also the, the steps to take. So how to begin to go through that pause, reflect and release phase, and then create your own at the end. So you create your own um, pause, reflect, release protocol. So that will work for you and your different emotional experiences if you are indeed an emotional leader. It's very effective. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Really cool. And then um, my question like, um, would be like, as you're working in the field of positive change, and I definitely would put the practice of mindfulness 
into that, especially in the arena of, you know, the food industry where a lot of with the dieting, dietary trends is really confusing for a lot of people. Um, what is your personal message of hope, if you have one, that, you know, um, as well, maybe in regards of, um, of environmental challenges or whatever we have at play as well, um, that, you know, can, can you, that you can give to the audience? Yeah, everybody has, everybody's body is truly amazing. And when it's given a chance, it wants to be in balance and it wants to be well. And so when you are providing your body with the nourishment that it desires and that you truly crave too, you're going to find your way to balance and your body will find its way into a state of well wellness and health. And it's the most valuable thing you can do is through the mindfulness process is pay attention. Just pay attention to everything. How food makes you feel. Paying attention to things about, because um, I think it is very confusing. We think like, oh, I should be eating this diet and this new dietary theories out. So it should be keto or paleo or be or whatever. And so trying to strip away those and notice what is your body? prefer, what makes you feel really good. And when you have really good energy, really great digestion, your skin feels healthy and clear, all of those things, most likely you're on the right path. And so I really encourage a personalized approach to wellness, to health and to nutrition, because I don't really believe that one person, everyone, every person rather is going to feel the same on different kinds of diets. And what might be really valuable to one person might be harmful to another. And so it's really just about kind of dimming out the noise of the, <laughs> the dieting industry and all the theories and coming home to yourself. And that's what mindfulness is all about. And through that, you can create what makes you feel vital, healthy, and well. I love that. And it just came in because I think I need, need to um, put that up because it's not just about the food, like improving the relationship with food, but you're also supporting and helping people then improving their relationship with yourself. How does that relate to each other. Um, can you give us like a short insight on that? <laughs> yes, I think that, yeah, it's absolutely, a, food dish is a metaphor for relationship with self. And so as you, that's what ends up happening. That's the real right. power of this mm -hmm. is that when you feel grounded and healthy and in well in yourself, then food is just, it becomes just food, which that should be nourishing and pleasurable and all of those positives, but it should not be our main source of pleasure and joy and all of those things. It just is enhancing life as it is because you feel good with who you are when you are free of emotional eating, when you're free of feeling controlled by food. Yeah, thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it was such valuable information. It was such a pleasure to have you today in here and um, sharing your knowledge about mindfulness and emotional eating. And I think it's really helpful to a lot of people out there. And thank you. Thank you all for watching and joining us today. And please stay tuned for more incredible content on how to eat to improve your health, empower your spirit and thrive for the planet. See you soon. Hey, thank you. Bye.